You are listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. Today, we're in Périgueux. Hello, I'm Richard Moore. I'm with Daniel Freib. Hello. Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And uh, we're in the Village des Par today, aren't we, in Bergerac, Lionel? Describe the scene. Well, it's a hive of activity in here. Um, the Village des Par hasn't really changed for about 15 years, really, has it? They still have the same style. They, there's, well, there's chairs and tables and, and canopies and umbrellas all advertising the various different Tour de France sponsors. There's a little market area where uh, you can get something to eat. Um, the hairdresser usually. was back yesterday for the first time in years. Really? Yeah, I don't know whether that's going to be a permanent reintroduction, but um, there was somewhere where you could get your hair cut, riders, journalists, anyone, and it made a reappearance yesterday after a long time away. Was that at Daniel Oss's request, perhaps, the BMC rider, he could do with a haircut? He could do with a job. But also, um, I was talking about the Village de Par yesterday with Rupert Guinness, um, because he did his first tour in 1987, which was when the Village des Par was introduced. And we said what they really need is a washing machine for journalists. That would be good, wouldn't it? There'd be a big queue, though, wouldn't there? There would always be a big queue at the washing machine. I don't think the Village des Par is really for journalists, is it? We're, we, it's encar- the riders are encouraged to come in here as well and mill about, but I think the buses sometimes offer a more comfortable and certainly more peaceful alternative. We're sitting in uh, the interview space uh, within the Village um, on seats with famous writers' names etched in the back. I'm on Sean Kelly. I wasn't. I did sit down initially on Lewis Ocania, but the chair was broken, um, a bit like uh, Ocania himself at various points in the tour. Um, famously crashed in the Col de Monte in 1971, wasn't it? Uh, so I'm on Sean Kelly now. Who are you on, Lionel? I'm on Andre Darigard, who uh, won many stages of the tour, probably well inside the top ten list of stage winners. But he was also the rider who crashed into an official in a sprint finish, I think in the Parc de France. Is that right? No, the wherever it was. It was on a velodrome, wasn't it? Lassie Powell. That's right, Lassie Powell. And uh, unfortunately, the official died as a result of his injuries in that crash. And I am sitting on Jacques Anquetil, fellow bon vivant. No Lance Armstrong seats here anymore. Well, I was going to say, that's the one thing about the village that has changed in recent years. The, there were a lot of these uh, Lance Armstrong seats and they've all gone. I, I just asked an ASO uh, official where they, where, what, what happened to them, whether they'd been recycled or remaindered. Or, apparently they were shipped. He said they were shipped to Austin, Texas. I'm not, sure if that's, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but they certainly... Lance Armstrong has been, has been airbrushed. I can see Greg, Greg LeMond over there and Alberto Contador, not the actual people, but chairs with their names on. Lionel, we must say a word or two about our incredible accommodation last night, which came about um, through through the podcast. Somebody, when the route was announced for the tour last October, somebody got in touch to say that she owns a very nice place just near Bergerac and invited us to go and stay there, and we did. We did indeed, yeah. It was called the Auberge Lou Payroll. It's uh, out, about half an hour out of Bergerac, um, near Sampoy de Londas, I think the village is called. Um, the hamlet is called San Marcel. It was a stunning place. It's a, uh, my room was in the roof space with all the exposed beams, um, lovely wooden floor, very, very comfortable. It's a, it was the best night's sleep I've had on the tour since the night I spent at home. But the meal last night, also the best meal we've had on the tour. It was extraordinary. I'm really sorry you missed out on this, Daniel. But you were there in spirit. And, uh, in fact, Fiona, the proprietor, is a psychologist by profession. And she offered a little psychological examination of the three of us based on listening to the podcast this morning. It was very, very interesting, wasn't it, Lionel? It was quite interesting. <laughs> Any more to add? Or? Well, are you going to explain what her findings were? Well, you, you heard them, I think, before I did. Well, she, she compared us to three brothers, with Richard taking the role of older brother, um, Daniel taking the role of quite uh, pushy younger brother, and me playing a sort of slightly um, mediator's role as the middle brother. That's I don't know. very generous to you, Lionel. I think it's because she was explaining it to you. I think if, if, it, if she had been explaining it to me, I'm sure I'd have got a, some kind of very uh, positive write-up. Uh, med- mediating yeah but just the last word on the meal because it was incredibly nice um i had a, a sort of crab a crab starter with a with a very fresh um sauce and then uh, then the duck was was really extraordinary very well cooked with some dauphinois potato and then we had the cheese to finish off it was uh, it really was the all category meal of the tour Oh. How, was, how was your evening, Daniel? You, you were in a very nice place too, I gather. Yeah, we were in a nice hotel, stayed with we in the same hotel as Green Edge, and, and we just about managed to 
um, find a table at a restaurant very late, about quarter to 11, amazingly got served, and we had a pizza, and it was fairly fairly standard fare, but in a beautiful spot on the Dordogne. I should just say, also, Fiona, our host last night, um, she's from the Isle of Man, big Mark Cavendish fan, and just behind the bar in the restaurant, um, she's got a, a framed copy of Le Keep um, from a couple of years ago, which uh, proclaimed Mark Cavendish as the king of sprinting. Absolutely, yes, and uh, yeah, we feel feel very refreshed. This is actually my last day on the tour. I fly home tonight, um, so Daniel and Lionel will be picking up the reins in Paris tomorrow and finishing off our tour coverage. It's been very enjoyable. Um, we're just at the start of the time trial, as I explained at the start of the podcast in Bergerac, and um, it, time trial days are funny days, aren't they? Because the action, if you can call it action, is sort of spread out over the whole day. The first rider, Cheng Ji, went off quite a couple of hours ago now. Uh, the last rider will go off in about another four hours. Uh, so there's a lot of hanging about, a lot of waiting. The team buses are arranged on a street adjacent to the village de Par, And it's very odd because we were just walking up through the buses and watching riders make their way to the start. There's a lot of people in there, and you know, people with buggies and things like that. And you see world-class athletes at a world-class sporting event weaving around buggies on their way to the start. It's it's just one of these curious little uh, features of the Tour de France, isn't it? Curious and very dangerous. I always think I'm amazed that no one ever seems to um, come a cropper on the way to the start. Particularly, you, you get a lot of team staff riding around on bikes as well, because there's a lot of. Um, sort of logistical jumping through hoops to get to the start, get team cars to the finish and back for for other riders and um, it's all very chaotic isn't it? Speak to anybody interesting this morning Daniel? Um, I spoke to Jean-René Bernardo, the Europe car manager, to see if um, this this issue, the uh, the alleged racist comments made by Michael Albacini to Kevin Razor, whether it's all sorted now and he said it was Um, he said that this is far from the first time that his riders have been racially well allegedly allegedly racially abused in in races he said that he's had to call up sponsors on on um, prior occasions um and um he says that yeah it's something that razor has dealt with throughout his life and certainly throughout his time in cycling so he wasn't necessarily as badly affected as um jean-rené bernardo and the the rest of the europe car clan were and we had a quick chat with Jonathan Votras, didn't we, Lionel? That interview will be in the Velo News edition of uh, the podcast, which will be uh, up very shortly as well. Um, and he was talking a little... He's been away for a bit of a tour, uh, meeting with sponsors and potential sponsors and guests, riding his bike. He's looking very tanned, drinking a lot of very fine wine and getting a hard time, I think, from uh, keen cyclists uh, uh, because he's doing he's as fit as he once was. Um, and he's been speaking to Andrew Talansky, uh, who he says will ride the Vuelta. He said that he's recovering from his physical wounds, but psychologically he's found this tour very difficult to watch because with the way the race has shaped up, he, you know, the riders who are, who are in contention now for the podium, he really feels that had things worked out differently, he would have been not only among them, but capable of, of beating some of them. And I think he views this as a, you know, a lost opportunity to perhaps challenge for the podium. Yeah, and he also talked about how the team took a few days to get over Talansky's, uh, losing Talansky and reassigning their roles. And, and he did make the point in the interview you can hear in the Velo News version of the podcast that um, every day that they had a chance to win, Garmin Sharp's riders were active. They got in breaks and, and tried to make things happen. Of course, it came very close with Jack Bauer, um, who was caught within, well, not just within sight of the line, almost within touching distance of the line. And, and, and Jonathan uh, couldn't really articulate exactly how exasperating and frustrating um, missing out so closely had been. But then, of course, Navadowskis, who, Richard, as you pointed out, was the replacement for David Miller, or, or was selected instead of David Miller, um, came up with a good winning the stage. And, and, and when you look at the Tour de France, like, a team like Garmin Sharp, you know, they came in with one plan and then they really have salvaged the tour from a, from the point of view of actually getting a stage win because so many teams are going home empty handed Did our proprietor Fiona last night not give us a little Navadowskis factoid? She did, she said that um, Navadowskis and an amateur had won the Tour of Dordogne, I've not managed to check that yet because I haven't been able to get online but um, we'll take Fiona's word for it because she also corrected me on uh, uh, well I wondered out loud whether the time trial that Miguel Indurain won so convincingly 20 years ago had gone from 
Bergerac to Perigo as the race is going today, and she said no, it was the other way around. Perigo to Ber Bergerac on a different road. So um, yeah, it's good to know that we're being corrected. I, well, I think she, we, we, I think she was sort of taking a claim to become a permanent member of the podcast. And sure, she could be our resident well, psychologist. Well, if she we wants to it. wants to do the catering, I would be very, very up for that indeed. If we want to hear more about Navadowskas, do we? I spoke to Jonathan Waters also this morning, independently of you guys, um, <laughs> about, about Navadowskas and this issue we mentioned, or I mentioned last night, of him um, having an aversion to the classics and, and really not wanting to entertain the idea of, of riding and doing well in the classics. So here is Waters talking about Navadowskas and the classics. Conversation with people before about Ramunas and he's got a bit of a mental block about the classics he just doesn't really want to entertain the idea of, of ah. getting motivated for them preparing for them what is that true is that I don't know I mean I, it's a good question but I, you know when you look at how he races you think shit this guy should yeah. like be winning Tour of Flanders or something yeah. right and does he, have, does he have issues with positioning or for, you know um, kind of rough and yeah, tumble I mean, or look, not at really? how, look at how I mean he was third in the field sprint the first well, day yeah, of the Tour yeah. Yeah. so I don't know I don't I mean uh, it's a good question. I mean, he doesn't love the real, you know, arch bargy position yeah. stuff. Um, but if you can do it in the field sprint in the Tour de France, I don't see why you can't mm. do it, you know, for, for um, you know, for the classic. I mean, he won the edge, but on the edge U23. Well, yeah, I was about to say, I was looking through his um, U23 results last night, and even Flanders, he was yeah, top yeah. five. And I think, or... like, he was third in Roubaix. Yeah, U23 yeah. Roubaix, he was third. So, yeah. I don't know. Uh, it, we, you know, two years ago, we, tr we put him on the full Cobble Classics program, and it didn't work at all. I mean, yeah. it, it was not. Just, and then we sent him home and said, okay, you know, this isn't working for you. And then you, like, want to stage a tour of Romandy. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, 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 I mean... It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky one. Um, I mean, he's not the only guy in the peloton like that, is he? You know, in, even Tony Martin, for instance, you know, right. Al Dag has often said, you know, he'd be a great Paris Bay rider if he could just yeah. you know, get his head around it. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, 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 you know, I don't know. I mean, I, it's, at the end of the day with those classics, you've got to love them and you've got to really want to do them. And if you don't have that, it's hard. Podcast daily during the Tour de France. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. Right, fellas, well, well the time trial hasn't finished yet, but we're in Perigo at the finish, and I'm afraid I have to go off and catch a plane back to London en route to Glasgow for the Commonwealth Games. I'm buying out a day early, so I'm sorry about that. That's all right, you're missing it. You're going to miss the, uh, the drama of who finishes second and who finishes third, although it's looking at the moment like Perot is going to take second and Pino third. Despite a bite change for Perot, some drama. It's a bit of a bombshell. You didn't tell us that before you were going to the Commonwealth Games. You just told us... <laughs> I don't think you even knew what the Commonwealth Games were until a couple of days ago and I explained them is to that, you. Is that cycling? Yeah, Rich, Richard's career is going full circle. A bit like Bradley Wiggins. 1998, you rode the Commonwealth Games for Scotland. As, as did Bradley Wiggins for England. I never, yeah. it, I, you've never mentioned that before, that you rode the Commonwealth Games for Scotland. <laughs> you know, I like to hide my light under a bushel, Daniel. Uh, <laughs> one of us has to on this podcast. But listen, <laughs> fellas, it's been a really enjoyable experience. And thank you very much to you two and to everybody who's listened and to all the people that we've been thanking. Um... John Mooney, Paul Scones, Nigel Brown, The Telegraph and Jaguar, of course. Thank you to all of those people. You've got one more podcast to do tomorrow in Paris. Will there be time in that podcast for a story about the golfer, Justin Rose? <laughs> <laughs> there, may, there may well be, Daniel. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that over our £10 pints of beer that we're, in, we're sure to have on the Champs-Élysées. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Lionel and Daniel, and let's uh, reconvene in London soon. The Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar, with Richard Moore, Lionel Burney and Daniel Freib. So Richard Moore has gone to Glasgow to cover the Egg and Spoon race in the Commonwealth Games. Sorry Richard, that's just a joke. Uh, it's of course a very important sporting event. That leaves just me and Daniel to wrap up the events from the time trial here in Perigo. Tony Martin won. We're just standing in a, in a playground outside uh, our press room, which is, a, I think, a secondary school, is this? It looks like yeah, it's a pretty... It's a pretty East, East European style um, building, isn't it? Um, it's, either a, it's either a secondary school or a lunatic asylum, which <laughs> might explain why Chiro's standing outside and making purposefully towards us right now. Well, for the second day in a row, Chiro, you're wearing pink. You're wearing the Maglia Rosa here. Yes, and, but maybe tomorrow for the Champs-Élysées I could change my kind of dressing. Also because in my hotel in Tarbes, 
uh, I remained three days and there was there was a great service of pressing as you call it in <laughs> French so I mean I use it a lot what are you going to wear yellow or are you going to wear turquoisey blue like Astana surprise okay we'll look out. not like Astana we'll look out for that so Chiro a big moment for you your first Italian Tour de France victory in your career as a cycling journalist yes yes it's the first one because it's my sixth Tour de France and I never won the yellow jersey but it's not me and I, <laughs> we won the yellow jersey, but Vincenzo Nibali. But the most important thing is that we won the yellow jersey for the, for the podcast, for the best cycling transmission ever. And I want to repeat this uh, to my and to our, to all our listeners. I want to repeat and repeat and repeat because it's right. It's the truth. So Nibali will be back as defending champion next year and we'll be back as the defending champions of the podcast. You'll be here, will you, Chiro? Uh, yes, but uh, our goal should be not to confirm, but to improve our performances. This is the right mentality. <laughs> and last thing for me, Chiro. So we talked earlier in the tour about your holiday to Greece, which we were all very excited about. We had that, you, you revealed that exclusively on the cycling podcast that you were going to Greece this year. Um, you were slightly concerned that Nibali winning might disrupt your departure because you might have to go to Sicily do you think? Uh, no I will go to Belgium on Monday uh, for the first criterium of Vincenzo Nibali with the yellow jersey in Alst a city of Belgium between Brussels and Alst on Tuesday I will back in Milan my birthday so a great event for our well, two days before Ita me Chiro. Yeah, two days before exactly, me exactly and uh, so a great event for the Italian society as you can imagine <laughs> but on Friday I will leave for Greece for two weeks and so bye bye Vincenzo Nibali and bye bye to everyone is that, is that it? is that all we get? so bye bye to you is this, is this the moment we say farewell? maybe maybe yes but never be never say never no the amount of work you've been doing, it's made you serious, Chiro. This is, we're not used to this. No, the problem is, dear Lionel, that I didn't start to write a line <laughs> and at 8 p.m. And so, you know, I'm a little bit in, er, in a hurry. But I always find the time for you, for the cycling podcast. It's very disconcerting. Chiro is now on, being, he's follow he's he's now being he's followed he's by gone. a documentary crew. Uh, to catch a rat, isn't it? <laughs> Bless him. He's off to write the first four pages of Gazetta. You're listening to The Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. To recap today, then, Tony Martin won the time trial, as expected, really. He wasn't really challenged. A minute and 39, I think, was his margin of victory. Vincenzo Nibali uh, was never going to be challenged. The intrigue was in the battle for the podium. And uh, Jean-Christophe Perrault, uh, he leapfrogged Thibaut Pino up to second. Um, Pino third and then I suppose the only other uh, story in the top six was that Roman Bardet suffered a puncture and had to change his bike and that allowed uh, TJ Van Garderen to jump over him into fifth place by only two seconds so a real mis a moment of misfortune for Bardet there. Yeah absolutely um, otherwise like you say the big the big surprise I suppose was how poorly Valverde performed um, you know we expected him to complete the podium maybe with Perot and um, he was was comprehensively beaten by Thibaut Pinot, who you know, confirmed what we'd been saying for a few days that um, he'd done a lot of work on his time trialing, and um, that we thought on a course like today's, which was hilly, and obviously coming at the end of the three week tour, he might surprise a few people, and um, he he did very well indeed. You you say that about the richest uh, sporting event in cycling. It is somewhat incongruous that here we are in a playground at a secondary school and. Uh, maybe two hours after the stage finished, Christian Prudhomme is sat at a table surrounded by journalists um, holding court. It, it wasn't the most formal of settings, but uh, we had a pretty good chat with him and uh, we managed to get a quick word with him in English after that um, for the podcast. So this is Christian Prudhomme, the race director, on his memories of this year's Tour de France. <laughs> I have many images in, in my mind. Uh, first time in Yorkshire. Gary Verity's head of Welcome to Yorkshire said to me, to you, uh, it was the uh, grandest grand part ever. And that's true. Uh, so many people, huge crowds, people without any cars on the roads, uh, people coming uh, uh, on their bikes, uh, uh, walking uh, with buses. But, uh, um, 
an example for us for sure and after it's the nomination of, of uh, Vincenzo Nibali um, uh, for me he's like Felice Gimondi who won the tour f- Italian rider who won the tour in 1965 very smart very clever uh, of course very good he was the master of this tour and obviously for us French two Frenchmen on the podium it's the first time it's been the first time for 30 years 1984 with uh, Laurent Fignon winner and Bernard in a second and uh, that's just uh, incredible because uh, many journalists perhaps you too asked me uh, three weeks ago is it possible to have Frenchmen on the podium and I answered no it's possible to have four Frenchmen in the top ten but not on the podium and they are obviously there was this race with so many surprises with Chris Froome uh, and and, uh, uh, Alberto Contador who had to quit the tour uh, after a fall but um, it's something new Uh, we have uh, in France in France a very good new generation but that's not only that because (laughs) Jean-Christophe Perrault is second he's 37 and he's 37 and 40 years ago in 1974 Raymond Poulida was second and he was 38 so I don't know if it's for Frenchmen but uh, Thibaut Pinot uh, is only 24 Romain Bardet is 6 he's only 23 uh, we have another guy, Juan Barguil, who won two stages in the Vuelta uh, last year, who is very, very good too, and we're new, good sprinters. So, uh, for the French riders, it's, it's the beginning of a new era. It's a new era. You made the point that La Planche de Belfi almost crowned the Tour de France. The first six there are the first six in the general classification. It, only the second time, but it is already becoming a modern classic. Yes, for sure. It, 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 it's, I'm very happy, and it's very strange, very odd for me, because uh, uh, when I was in the Netherlands and in the UK uh, before the Tour, uh, two journalists uh, told me... Uh, uh, and la, la planche des belles dames, it's, it's very hard. And uh, la planche des jeunes filles, it's very hard too. So, planche des belles filles, planche des belles dames, planche des jeunes filles. But that means, even if it's not exactly the name, it's in the mind of, of the people, of journalists, of all the people who, who, who love cycling and love the tour. So, yes, it's, it's, uh, and it's very important for us because it's a summit that is not in the Alps, neither in the Alps nor in, in the Pyrenees. Very good. Neither, no. Very good. Very hard for a Frenchman. <laughs> <laughs> it's ironic that, uh, it, we started in England, and we have the biggest French success yes. for 30 years. Would Thank you, you so much. Ah, well, well, it's <laughs> good game. But it is. But it is. Uh, is that true? Like a big coincidence. It's. It's. I don't know if it's a coincidence. It's. It was like a mirror. And thank you for showing that the French are not the only people mm. in the world mm. who love the tour. Mm. Uh, you can have people loving the tour outside of France. Uh, Grandest country in the world. That was perhaps true 20 years, uh, 100 years ago. That's no more true. But uh, thank you, merci. Yes, really, it was unbelievable. Uh, it was incredible. Uh, it was uh, unforgettable. So uh, I don't know if it if it's if it's strange, but uh, c'était très beau. When will you come back to England? <laughs> the question is good. It's not a question of if. It's a question of when. Mm. I don't know. And even if I knew. No answer. (laughs) (laughs) Listeners of the podcast really enjoyed the way you said bunting. Could you say it again just for the listeners of the podcast? Bunting. (laughs) Humongous. Massive. You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. Tweet us at cycling underscore podcast. So that was Christian Prudhomme. Otherwise known as Prudy. Otherwise known as Prudy. Played in by a blast of the French national anthem to celebrate the fact that two Frenchmen are on the podium for the first time in 30 years. Um, Daniel, we've got to make our way up to... Limoges. Limoges, yeah. Splitting our journey in Limoges. We've made a, a logistical... You'll be all right, Lionel. You'll be all right. I know you sound, you sound you know, very daunted by this journey, but no, you'll be all right. No, I'm frustrated that we're not going a bit further and chewing no, off right. a bit more of that journey. It leaves four hours of well, driving when for Sunday. You, when you booked a hotel in Limoges, were you thinking that... Pascal Hervé of um, Festina Scandal fame used to own a restaurant there and we've, we've, we've um, stopped off there before on the tour La Bibliothèque it's called but do you know what he's emigrated to Canada so we can't even go there for dinner well I don't think we're going to make dinner but uh, no the reason the reason was I thought I was going to have to drop Richard at Bergerac airport to catch his flight but he managed to get a lift with somebody else so I played it safe booked in at Limoges can't refund the the room so we've got to stay there and then we've got to try and make it up to Paris for the La Course the women's race which is going to mean getting up at the crack of dawn it's a sad sad situation (laughs) on that note Daniel thank you very much Elton John related you're a Watford fan yeah you know there is a link yeah (laughs)
Well, Daniel, thank you very much for that. Um, see you... Well, I'll see you in Paris, obviously, because you'll be in the passenger seat in I'll the Jaguar. You, I'll see you in a minute, Lionel, when you stop recording. <laughs> thank you. Podcast daily during the Tour de France. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar.